Prime Time Crimes presents this crime education documentary featuring two real-life crime stories and I recommend watching as if you are the victim in each story. You will be able to identify the warning signs that led up to the incident. Then consider what you would do to prevent this from happening to you or to someone in your family and leave me a comment. If we can learn from these videos, we will be educated instead of just entertained and we can move from being paranoid to being prepared. Thank you in advance for subscribing, liking and sharing this video. On Wednesday, May 20th, 2015, in the remote town of Gunnison, Colorado, Randy Martinez and Nate Lopez realize they haven't heard from their friend, 29-year-old rancher Jake Millicent, in nearly five days. On May 15th, he had gone out with some friends and they had made plans for the next day and Jacob never called, never reached out to them. Jake's mother, Deborah Rudabaugh, and his sister, Stephanie Jackson, meet Jake's friends in the corral on the sprawling ranch where Jake and his family live. They approach Deborah and Stephanie asking if they had seen Jake or knew where Jake was, and that's when Deborah told them that he had gone to uh, Reno, Nevada. Deb Rudabaugh told them that he had left to participate in MMA training or a tournament. She did not know exactly when he would be returning. Jacob is very involved in MMA, uh, mixed martial arts. He was involved with a gym here in Gunnison and a group of individuals that enjoyed that activity and pursued it diligently. The friends are not understanding why Jacob would just pick up and leave without at least telling them. He shared a lot with his friends. If he had been planning, especially a big trip, he would have let people know. With Deborah's information limited, Nate and Randy decide to check in at Jake's martial arts gym to see when their friend might be back. The sparring partners explained that there was no tournament or training that they knew of in Reno, Nevada. They further found out a little bit more information that he was injured that week and was on crutches because he had hurt his ankle and so he wouldn't have traveled uh, to participate in that. His friends, they heard from him every day. So when they stopped hearing from him, it definitely bothered them. For Jake to miss a gathering with friends, if he said he was gonna be there, he would be there. Um, and if something had come up, he would make sure to contact people and say, like, hey, you know, I can't make it. I think everyone early on was pretty nervous that something had happened. Jacob Millison was born on January 11th, 1986 in Colorado, just a year or so after his older sister, Stephanie. Jacob's parents, Deborah and Ray Millison, had left Ohio for adventure out west in Gunnison County, Colorado. Gunnison is an extremely remote mountain community. Uh, we're about three and a half hours from a major airport. A lot of our community makes a living through ranching or farming. For Deborah, the home in Gunnison was a lifelong dream come true. My sister, from the first time that we made a trip to Colorado with my parents when we were young, she fell in love with Colorado and ranches and seeing horses run free. She was drawn to the Old West ideas. Once the family moved to Gunnison, Deborah started work at the nearby 7-Eleven Ranch, a 700-acre operation owned by Marion Rudy Rudabaugh, a widower nearly 20 years Deborah's senior. Rudy was one of the most interesting men that I've ever been around. Um, you, you meet him, he's not very tall, but he was tough as nails. They did a dude ranch operation and then, you know, outfitting, which is taking hunters into the backcountry to hunt. At that time, it was very profitable. Rudy had a fairly large lodge built on the uh, property in addition to several cabins. As Rudy approached his 70s, Deborah stepped in to help her boss manage the ranch. In 1993, she divorced Ray and made a surprise announcement to her family. When Jake and Stephanie's mom and dad split, Deborah moved to marry Rudy. Stephanie and Jake moved up here to Rudy's ranch. They were both young. I would say Jake was probably six. It surprised the whole family in the fact that, you know, 
Rudy was so much older than Deb, but Debbie seemed happy. Deborah, Jake, and Stephanie all joined in to help Rudy manage the ranch. Deborah even homeschooled the kids to give them more time to pitch in. Growing up on a ranch, Jake definitely had a strong work ethic. He was very responsible for his chores and his jobs. There was a couple times I helped him on the ranch with haying and stuff, and it's absolutely hard work. But Jake never complained about it. Stephanie helped pack hunters in and out. She did that with Rudy. She is very good with animals, and especially horses. Um, she's right at home in the saddle. When Stephanie was just 18 years old, she met 19-year-old David Jackson, who worked on a traveling carnival that had made a stop in Gunnison. When the carnival left just three days later, David stayed behind. My impression of Dave when we first met him was that he was an odd guy. To make such a drastic change in life by, you know, staying in a town with a girl that he just met three days ago was a little odd. After a few months of dating, the young couple married in 2003. To help start her new life, Stephanie's stepdad, Rudy, allowed her to access her inheritance. Rudy and Deb gave Stephanie $80,000 so they could buy a home. They didn't stay in Gunnison. They did take part of their inheritance and use that money to buy a residence in Denver. With his sister gone, Jake was expected to take on more responsibility at the ranch. In 2009, Rudy's health fell into a quick decline. And on November 16th of that year, the 85-year-old rancher passed away leaving the 7-Eleven property to Deborah. When Rudy passed away, I know it was hard for, it was hard for everyone. It was hard for Jake. It was hard for Deb. My sister went into a pretty deep depression. She withdrew from everybody. That was her life, the ranch. And no matter what, she didn't want to let go of it. Managing the massive ranch with just two people wasn't easy. The hunting guiding stopped, but it seemed like things were always kind of going downhill from that point on. It was a lot of trying to keep their head above water. By 2012, there were other big changes happening at the 7-Eleven Ranch when Stephanie announced that she, David, and their young son would be returning to town after being away for eight years. She wanted to move back to Gunnison because she didn't want her to raise her child. Uh, in Denver. Stephanie and David moved into an apartment in town. David began working mechanic shops. Stephanie Jackson began giving rides and helping Deb Rudabaugh run the guest ranch. With another set of hands to help out at the ranch, it seemed like Deborah and Jake finally had a chance to return 7-Eleven to its former glory. Jake had talked that he would probably end up staying on the ranch and he'd probably end up working it. Uh, he wasn't always fond of that idea, but it's what he knew and it's what he did well. I think he always felt just strong ties to the ranch. Which is why Jake's friends are worried when Jake vanishes from the 7-Eleven ranch in May of 2015. He was not a, certainly not a spontaneous kind of person. It was just very out of character for Jake. All of these things raised more suspicion in their mind that something sinister had happened to Jake. On May 20th, five days since Jake's friends have heard from him, Randy Martinez and Nate Lopez meet with a Gunnison County detective to file a missing persons report for their friend. This case started with his friends filing reports before the family had even acknowledged that he might have been missing. And that is odd for an investigation. It was a huge red flag for a lot of people. On May 20th, 2015, Randy Martinez and Nate Lopez have just filed a missing persons report for their friend and local rancher, 29-year-old Jake Millison. They reported to the sheriff's office that Jake had not been seen for about a week, and they were concerned about where he was at. Detectives agreed to go speak with Jake's mother, Deborah Rudabaugh, owner of the nearby 7-Eleven ranch. She didn't remember the, the last time that she'd seen Jake. She didn't remember what day it was. She informed law enforcement that Jacob had gone to Reno 
to participate in a training of some sort for MMA. She had a good reason why his friends couldn't get a hold of him. She said he dropped his phone in an irrigation ditch and on the way out of the house. And so that's why he wasn't able to answer his phone. Deborah showed them his phone. She had that in a plastic bag with rice to draw out the, the moisture in the phone. They are reassured by Deborah that Jake is uh, fine. It's not unusual for Jake to take trips and, and be gone for a while. So it, at that point, that kind of puts law enforcement at ease that nothing unusual has happened to Jake. But with no trace of Jake over the next few weeks, concern spreads, and two other groups of Jake's friends file their own missing persons reports. It was a very unusual situation. The family was like, no, 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 he's fine. He'll come back someday. He frequently leaves and comes back. That simply wasn't true, and the friends knew it. It was really his friends that were very concerned, and they're the ones that really pushed for more investigation. By August of 2015, now three months since Jake's disappearance, even Deborah Rudabaugh is beginning to express concern over her 29-year-old son's whereabouts. She had filed a missing persons report because he had been gone way too long. You know, a mother wants to know where her child is. It's interesting, though, because he disappeared in May, and she didn't file it until August. During the meeting, Deborah says that since joining the MMA gym in Gunnison, Jake had changed. Deborah Dorod begins to describe Jacob as lazy on the ranch and not helping her as much. She makes it clear that the ranch is not doing as well. He would stay out all night. She said that she had found a marijuana grow on the ranch. Deb thought perhaps he was selling drugs. Deborah says that on May 24th, 2015, she and Jake had fought about his behavior. She reported that they had had an argument over the direction Jake was taking with his life. She felt like he was close to 30 years old and he needed to get out and get a real job because the ranch wasn't a moneymaker at that point. Deborah says that Jake had stormed out, telling her he was going to an MMA match in Reno. But Deborah hadn't told deputies that Jake had come back on May 31st with a friend. She classified it as one of Jake's friends, but not a local friend. She said that friend's name might have been uh, Mike or Matt, but that's all she knew. She said that Jake gathered up a lot of camping equipment Deb Rudabaugh made it clear that the supplies that Jacob took with him were for an extended period of time. That she was not expecting him back anytime soon, nor did she have any idea where he was at. But now that he's been gone for three months, Deborah says she fears the worst. She feared that he had fallen into a group of bad people. When they were asking her, so what do you think's happened to Jacob? And she said, well, I don't know. He's probably gotten in above his head somewhere. Despite Deborah's suspicions, investigators have no solid leads to uncovering Jake's whereabouts. They did put out an all attempt to see if there any law enforcement agency had come into contact with Jake, uh, either in uh, Nevada or nationwide. No indication of any use of any... Uh, credit cards, uh, social security numbers, or anything uh, like that. They just could not find a hit on Jacob throughout the country. Two more months go by, and there is still no sign of Jake. Then, on October 15th, the Gunnison County Times runs an article about Jake's case written by journalist Chris Rourke. I shared with the community the friend's concern about Jake's disappearance. But I also gave Deb's side of the story, and she claimed he was involved in drugs and had just run off in the middle of the night. Deb made some implications that that would, could have led to his disappearances, and that he had a pretty dark side. Shortly after the article's release, Jake's friends contact the Gunnison County Sheriff's Office. Jake's friends were pretty upset. They insisted that what Deb Rudabaugh was telling was not the truth. The fact that uh, Deb was portraying him as someone that's doing cocaine and, and drinking all the time, that's just 
That's ludicrous. Anyone that saw him at the bars knew that he just drank a Coke. Jake's friends also tell investigators that when Jake first went missing, they created a Facebook group dedicated to finding him. Over the last few months, some disturbing stories about Jake's brother-in-law, David Jackson, have trickled in online. A couple weeks after Jacob's disappearance, David Jackson posted a picture of Jacob's Harley on Facebook. And that was a huge red flag that Harley was his pride and joy. He did not let anyone else write it, touch it, do anything with it. In this particular uh, case, I think this is something that changed the uh, direction of the investigation. We have facts like the motorcycle really make you think the family knows more than they're telling law enforcement. Gunnison County Sheriff's investigators have just learned of a potential new suspect in the disappearance of Jake Millison, his brother-in-law, David Jackson, who'd been spotted around town on Jake's cherished motorcycle. Given the information that had been provided to law enforcement that Jake had simply taken a trip, it made no sense that David would be using Jake's vehicles. Nobody got to get near the sports sir. Um, and that was kind of like his baby and his prized possession. He wouldn't even let me touch that bike, so I can't imagine the person that he gets a little, doesn't get along with would be allowed to ride it and take pictures with it. Friends say that Jake and David's relationship only got worse when Stephanie and David moved back to Gunnison in 2012. Deb was going to leave that ranch to her grandson. So she wanted to hang on to it at all costs, and that's what drew Stephanie to move back onto the ranch, I believe. There was always a lot of tension between Dave maybe not doing his share of the work, or uh, Dave not feeling like that Jake was doing his share of the work. I know they were continually arguing about things on the ranch. Dave was trying to just take control and do whatever he wanted, and Jake was supposed to, you know, be in charge of it. According to friends, the feud finally came to a head in the winter of 2012. Jacob Millicent was plowing the snow on the ranch, and it somehow blocked in David's vehicle, and an argument between the two of them has started. Jacob describes the incident at that point, as it got heated, that David Jackson brandished a firearm to him in a threatening manner. Jake walked away from the uh, altercation but did file a restraining order on David. Jake had told his friends, if anything ever happens to me, look at my brother-in-law. Jake definitely thought he was in danger. It tells you that he was concerned. For Jacob to make the statement, if anything happens to me, it was David, that's a very powerful statement. But at that point, we had no evidence to point directly at David. In April of 2016, nearly a year after Jake's disappearance, David's friend Jeremy McDonald moves to the ranch to help out. I met Dave when we were like nine years old, and we just ended up being good friends. Dave sent me a message around the end of 2015. He started telling me, hey, you should move on out here, help us take over the ranch and get it going again. So I drove to Gunnison, Colorado, on the hope that we were going to be able to make something great. That same year, Deborah Rudabaugh receives a grim diagnosis. Deb had stage four breast cancer. Uh, the chances of her living a long life were not good. As the 7-Eleven Ranch prepares for a future without its matriarch, Investigators work to ensure that Jake's whereabouts are uncovered in Deb's lifetime. Investigations like this take a great deal of time. The last time that Jacob Millison was seen alive was on the 7-Eleven Ranch. And when we got to the point that we were ready to search the property and we knew that that's what needed to be done, there was a search warrant that was created and we knew that the chances of finding Jacob alive were just not great at that point. On July 17, 2017, over two years since Jake was last seen alive, a team of local and state law enforcement arrives at the 7-Eleven Ranch. I'd say there's probably seven different officers there. As we're walking up, I see 
investigators questioning Dad. The sheriff's office and CBI met with Deborah to advise her that we had a search warrant for the property. She first denies any knowledge that Jake is, is on the ranch. At that point, they explained to her that the cadaver dog teams would be brought in and that a full search would be done. And it was at that point that she confessed to killing Jacob. That was devastating. I just didn't know what to say, what to think. It's my nephew and that's my sister. It took me out at the knees. Deborah tells law enforcement that in the months before Jake's death, she and her son had fought about who would inherit the ranch. Deb had described that Jacob felt that the ranch was supposed to be left to him when Deb passed away. Jake felt like he had more of a claim to the ranch, especially since Rudy had given already a bunch of money to Dave and Stephanie to buy a house and continue to work on the ranch even when Steph was gone. Debra says that by mid-May of 2015, their dispute took a turn in a terrifying new direction. They had gotten into some argument and Jacob was upset with her. He had come into her room and had threatened her and then had turned and left and went to bed. She had decided that night that it was either her or him. So she took her Lady Smith 357 Magnum walked up the stairs when he was asleep, shot him in the head, and killed him. Deborah says that after killing Jake, she started planning how she was going to dispose of her son's body. She said she went upstairs and that she rolled him onto plastic, wrapped him in plastic, cinched him up in a fetal position with a rope, used a winch, to drag his body to the head of the stairs, slid him down the stairs, and then drag him out of the lodge by use of a, the ATV and a winch and buried the body in the manure pile. She just points over from the corral fence and says that's where he's at. They found Jacob's body about six feet deep in the corral. He was wrapped in plastic and a tarp. CBI agents and the Gunnison County Sheriff's Office continue their search of the property without arresting Deborah. Because of the speedy trial rule in Colorado, once a person is arrested, the time starts ticking in terms of discovery issues to defense, etc. We had more to gain by not arresting her and continuing to investigate than we did by arresting her and then having the uh, speedy trial clock start running. It was unclear to us the extent of other people's involvement in both the murder of Jacob, but also the cover-up of evidence. We were highly suspicious of any and all information coming from Deb Rudabaugh. Although Deborah claims that she threw the murder weapon into a nearby lake, detectives find a gun under her bed that matches her earlier description. She talked about how she alone had removed Jacob's body from his bedroom where she had shot him. Things aren't adding up. July 17th, 2017. Deborah Rudabaugh's confession of her son's murder has left investigators with lingering questions over whether or not she acted alone. He was in an upstairs loft of the lodge, and she was a very petite woman weighing less than 90 pounds. So it was clear to us there was no way that Deborah could roll a 185, 90 pound body off of the mattress and drag it out. If she did it, she did not do it alone. While teams continue to search the massive ranch for clues, detectives separate and interview Deb's daughter, Stephanie Jackson, and her husband, David. By the time they interviewed David, Deb had already confessed. He described being shocked. He couldn't believe that um, Jacob was on the ranch. He denied any knowledge of knowing anything about Jake's murder. David Jackson had described that he was not in town the evening that Jacob went missing, that he was in Denver. 
When detectives ask about Jake's restraining order filed in 2012, David insists the incident was a misunderstanding. He refuted the allegation that he had pulled a gun on Jake, saying only that he was wearing a gun and that Jake had saw the gun. It is his statement that he never meant to intimidate or threaten Jacob with the gun during that incident. In a nearby room, detectives break the news of Deborah's confession to Stephanie. She began to cry and got very upset and was very, very emotional. Stephanie says that although the siblings disagreed about the ranch, she would never want Jake hurt. But detectives are taken aback when Stephanie asks an unusual question. At one point, she responded with confusion or, I guess, bewilderment at how Mom got Jacob out of the house. And at that point in time, no one had told her where Jake had been killed. So that really stuck out in their mind that she knew a lot more than she was telling at that point, and that we would definitely have to do some further investigation. Detectives start by issuing subpoenas for David and Stephanie's cell phone and social media records. Law enforcement did learn fairly early on that David had an alibi. So we were able to confirm that, yeah, he was in Denver at the time of the disappearance. Stephanie's phone records aren't so clear cut. So out at the ranch, there is no cell service. It's one of the few places I think left that you cannot do a cell phone ping to figure out where people are. Detectives turn to Stephanie's social media accounts and something in May of 2015 catches their attention. On the 19th, Stephanie posted, have you ever been woken up with such awesome news that you wanted to run outside screaming? It was just within hours after Jake went missing, which we later found out was when he died. It's very suspicious. In my opinion, it indicates that all of a sudden, life got better for her because Jake was gone. They do ultimately find a will. It leaves the ranch solely to Stephanie Jackson, and it was dated late April, just within two weeks of Jacob's murder. That will was posted by Stephanie at the end of April to some of her social friends, where she was claiming that she was now the sole heir to the ranch. In search of hard evidence linking Stephanie to the murder, detectives turn to Jake's autopsy. The autopsy was consistent with Deb's story that he was shot while he was asleep laying in his bed, and the bullet did not exit. It remained in the skull. After the autopsy, we were able to retrieve the bullet um, from Jacob's skull and was able to do a ballistic test with the Smith & Wesson that was found at the root of our home. We determined it was the murder weapon. In July 2017, detectives asked Stephanie and David to take a polygraph. Both of them agree. Did, did you know anything about it at all? Like his wife, David also denies involvement. Let me just ask you, I think so. Did you kill him? No. Did you help dispose the body, wrap it up, anything whatsoever? I think I would have killed But the couple's united front has no bearing on the results of the polygraph test. Both David and Stephanie were found to be deceptive. Detectives confront them with the results. Why did you so severely not pass the test? Honestly, I don't know. I, I, I should have passed it because I didn't do anything. He stayed adamant the entire time, though. He had no idea that Jacob was going to be killed or exactly what took place. But he admits that he did know Jake was dead. In June 2017, he and his farmhand, Jeremy McDonald, had been working in the corral when they made a gruesome discovery. We were just cleaning out some of the corrals, and Dave was out on a skid loader uh, moving some manure, and Steph was back there with him. And well, I heard the skid loader shut down and walked back there, and there was 
Dave and Steph standing over the pilot manure, and I could see basically the upper torso and rib cage wrapped in plastic. Steph turned to instant panic and started just kind of screaming, yelling, um, just cover it up, Dave, cover it up, and I'm, I'm going to call mom, and she took off running into the house, and uh, Steph comes back out maybe 10 minutes later, just leave it alone, just leave it alone. Mom said it's uh, illegal wild game that Jake shot like a bear. Mom just says it's a dead animal. Dude, just cover it up. So that's exactly what I did. I just covered it up. Do you do it with Jake in the manure pile? We were pretty dang sure of it. I don't know why I didn't say nothing. I knew I should have. I've had that gut feeling. I should just say something. I'm scared for my son, my wife, and mine, and everybody else's future. My God, I wish I would have said something. Uh, David would not commit to who he thought killed Jacob. However, he was highly suspicious that Stephanie may have killed Jacob. It very quickly to me became apparent that Steph knew a lot more than she was letting me or Dave or anybody else know. After failing a polygraph, David Jackson has admitted to investigators that he believes his wife, Stephanie Jackson, may have murdered her brother, Jake Millison. In another room, detectives confront Stephanie. Stephanie admitted to knowing that Jacob's body was in the manure pile, but she didn't know that she was help covering up until later on. There's still something that you're not telling us. It's not just me. Everybody believes you, you were involved. It's fortunate for them. No, it's unfortunate for you. Because right now, you failed, failed the polygraph regarding whether you shot him or whether you helped move that body out of the house. She never said anything to me about it. And I did not help her drag him out of the house. So your DNA should be on the gun that held the gun. I don't think I shot her. But therein lies the out. A person who had nothing to do with this would have said, I don't think you turn to the final resident of the ranch they haven't spoken to farmhand jeremy mcdonald during our interview mcdonald was the one that gave us the dynamic of the family and basically told us that it was stephanie who was in charge stephanie is the one who gave the orders steph would sit inside and tell everybody what to do she wanted everybody else to do everything for her so she was pretty controlling. Jeremy also confirms David's story about discovering Jake's body in the manure pile. Law enforcement asked him why he didn't come forward sooner with his belief that that was Jacob. Staff said, you know, you can't ever leave now, right? And still, I mean, I didn't know what to think. It was definitely... Uh, um, unnerving, uncomfortable. He was afraid of uh, Stephanie, and so was David. David was afraid of Stephanie. In March 2018, with Jeremy's testimony, detectives arrest Stephanie, David, and Deborah, charging them with first degree murder, abuse of a corpse, and destruction of evidence. I think that they probably had this grand plan that. Um, with Deb being diagnosed with cancer, that she would be the one that did it, and she would just die in prison, and, you know, Stephanie, they would have the ranch. Jake's murder happened because of greed and because of who was going to own the ranch. It was all about property, all about the ranch. Rather than face a trial, all three defendants agreed to plea deals. David enters an Alford plea and receives 10 years in prison for tampering with a human body. We just could not prove that he had much involvement in the actual killing of Jacob, um, but he was very involved with the cover-up. 
Deb Rudabaugh plead guilty to murdering Jacob. She also, of course, restated that Stephanie didn't have anything to do with the murder. Deb's sentencing was very cold. She never really talked about Jacob and who he was or that she was remorseful. She was sentenced to 40 years. It's unbearable and unthinkable to to think about someone killing your own child um, in such a cold and, and callous way. Stephanie Jackson pleads guilty to tampering with a body. As part of her plea agreement, all other charges are dropped, including first-degree murder. She was sentenced to 24 years. Stephanie's sentence was a surprise uh, because it was at the maximum level. As the dust settles in Gunnison, the murder of Jake Millison is not a case the town, and especially Jake's close-knit circle of friends, will ever forget. The fact that it was family members doing it to family members is just even more heart-wrenching and disgusting. Jake is always going to be remembered as gentle, soft-spoken, um, and caring. Jake's friends were the reason that the investigation happened. If it hadn't been for them, who knows? Who knows how long it would have taken before somebody realized that he was gone? Jacob's friends, they couldn't save his life, but they found him some justice. April 12, 2012, 10 p.m. It's a quiet night in Erie, Pennsylvania, as members of the Leader of Men Riding Club are winding down for the night in their clubhouse. The Leader of Men Riding Club, they're motorcycle enthusiasts. They enjoy riding motorcycles, they have fundraisers, they have a band. The clubhouse is kind of like their hangout, their meeting point. But the camaraderie is shattered when gunshots ring out overhead. So they duck and scatter in the clubhouse when the shots went off. Club members believe the sounds came from the apartment upstairs. Michael Henry lives in an apartment above their clubhouse. And he's a member of another motorcycle club, the Iron Wings, and he's a prominent member in that club. As the air grows quiet, Leader of Men club member Petey Miller calls Mike to find out what's going on. He called approximately five times. Michael Henry's not picking up his phone. Now he's getting concerned. Now he's getting worried. It's dead silent up there. Petey reaches out to several of Mike's club members. Within minutes, a small group of iron wings shows up. They bang on Mike's front door, which is a door in the middle of the building that exits out into the parking lot where everybody is parked. This door is locked. They go to the back door and they find that this door is ratcheted closed with an industrial ratchet. Fearing for Mike's safety, his club members kick in the exterior door. As two of the men walk cautiously up the stairs to Mike's apartment door, they're met with a horrific sight. He then sees Michael Henry sitting in there on the futon, slumped over to the side. There was a large amount of blood on the carpet. There was a large amount of blood on the futon. Petey Miller made the 911 initial call. He calls and says there had been a shooting. Officers arrive in minutes and are immediately taken aback by the gruesome scene. He was shot approximately four times. Who could have done this? Who would have had a motive to do something like this? 31-year-old Erie native Michael J. Henry was known for his big stature and love of motorcycles. I'd kind of known him for pretty much all his life. Everybody just called him Big Mike because he, he was big. He always loved bikes, you know. He knew a lot about them. He was a mechanic, so he knew how to build them, too. Mike actually started his own motorcycle club called the Iron Wing Club. They're very serious about their motorcycles. They're very serious about being bikers. It was just a bunch of guys that had regular jobs. They all hung out together a lot on the weekends and stuff like that. It was all about motorcycles. Mike was just as dedicated to the club as he was to running his own business. 
he had a dream of working for himself. He wanted to start his own pallet company, kind of like you, you take these pallets and you, you kind of just pick them up from businesses and you, you recycle them. And eventually his idea was to take the pallets and make them into other things. Though Mike had big ambitions, he did have a checkered past. Mike had a short fuse. If he got something in his head where that kind of made him angry, it wasn't so easy to calm him down. Mostly people appeared to be afraid of him. They were, he was known to start fights with people. Mike had served five years in prison for aggravated assault where he beat a man into a coma. They were at a bar and someone was harassing the girl. So he kind of got in a little brawl there and then ended up in jail. After his five-year prison sentence was complete, Mike worked to turn his life around. In addition to co-founding the Iron Wings and starting his own company, Mike found love in 2006 when an old friend walked back into his life. I didn't live here for like 10 years. He was actually at my brother's house. And I went over there and um, just kind of started talking to him because I, I, mean, I was attracted to him. Single mother of three, Nicole Spinelli, had no problem seeing past Mike's tough exterior. He was really funny. I mean, he could make me laugh. Like, probably, I'd never laughed before, which was interesting because everyone looks at him like this big, scary guy because he was huge, you know, but um, he was actually just a softy in a way. The two quickly fell head over heels. We had a lot of fun. We would go motorcycle riding. We were together 24-7. It seemed like I just couldn't wait to always be with him. In 2010, after four years together, the couple found out they were expecting a baby. He talked about it all the time, you know, us having a child, but I really didn't plan on having any more kids. I think we were both kind of like shocked and excited. He always wanted to be the best father he could be. In May of 2011, the couple welcomed their son, Jackson. He longed to be a you know full-time father, that's for sure. That was really important to him. I think it all stems from him not being around his father as much as he would have liked growing up. While things were great at first, Mike eventually slipped back into old habits. He succumbed to the pressure of the club. You know, they were going out every night, you know, and they wouldn't come home. It was just kind of like a bad time. But it should have been a good time. Ultimately, the couple split in 2012. Neither one of us really knew what we were going to do. It was very confusing. I was going to do what I could to see if we could fix things. But before Mike and Nicole could work out their differences, tragedy strikes when Mike's life is cut short on April 12th, 2012. The police went to the place where uh, 911 had directed them, which was an apartment over a motorcycle club. As officers begin clearing the apartment, they hear a faint cry coming from the next room. They discovered Mike's 10-month-old son in the crib, just waking up, starting to cry. Luckily, the child appears unharmed. You start to think, who would do this? Who would fire off four or five shots in an apartment with a 10-month-old child? within 15 feet of his father. It was shocking, vile, and so violent. On the night of April 12, 2012, Erie, Pennsylvania police officers find 31-year-old Mike Henry shot to death in his apartment. Their first order of business is protecting Mike's 10-month-old son. The thing that got everybody is that his son was sitting there and then Whoever shot him, shot him, killed him, and left, and the son was still there. The child was okay and was removed uh, and taken into custody by Child Protective Services. I was very shocked when I found this out. Um, my mom called me and told me Mike's dead. And, you know, the first thing through my head is, well, you know, where's the baby? And the baby's fine. I mean, I couldn't believe it. I was thankful that nothing happened to my son. A lot of thankfulness and, you know, tears at the same time. It was a very hard time, though. It definitely was. As Mike's son is taken away, detectives arrive on the scene and get to work. Mike Henry was shot four times. He was shot once in the leg, twice in the chest, and once in the head. We could tell that it, it didn't take long 
for him to pass. It would have been a matter of seconds. Thoughts were initially, okay, was this homicide committed by a rival motorcycle club? Or was it something more personal? Based on the positioning of the body and the location of the bloodstains, detectives theorize about what may have happened. The individual walked up on him while he had been laying in bed and initially fired. And then upon him getting up, continued the fire and walked out of the apartment right after that. So it was almost like walking by, shooting somebody and continue to walk out of the apartment. As detectives search the scene, they recover four shell casings. The shell casings were 9mm shell casings, which told us that a 9mm handgun would have been used and that it matched up with the number of shots that we believe were on Mike Henry. Though detectives are able to determine the type of weapon used, they are unsure how the killer gained access to Mike's apartment. We're looking trying to figure out, okay, how, how would this individual get into this apartment without Mike Henry knowing? Being that his size and everything and the position that he was in, he was surprised. Although detectives have many questions, there is one thing they know for sure. There's a TV there, there's appliances there, there's money located in a bedroom. It doesn't appear that burglary or robbery was the motive. The fact that it looks like they got in there shot him and got out. That was the intent. It was The intent was to kill Mike Henry. Since there were no signs of forced entry, detectives suspect one of two things. Somebody either had a key or they knew how to get into the apartment without having to uh, kick in the door or pry it open or anything like that. So everybody close to Mike was a suspect at first. CSI continues processing the scene. Witnesses are transferred to the station for interviews. Detectives first speak with Leader of Men Motorcycle Club member Petey Miller. He's the one that made the 911 initial call. We learned that he heard an argument, some shuffling around, and then pop, pop, some more muffled sounds, and then a pop, pop, pop. Petey says he hadn't called 911 right away because he didn't want to upset Mike. He said, if Mike was up there doing something himself, I didn't want him to get pissed off at me. I'm not going to get involved. I'm going to let his motorcycle club look into it. He was a biker, and he lived the biker life. Nobody messed with Big Mike. Petey says three weeks earlier, the Iron Wings and another club had gotten into a brawl. There was an incident involving Michael Henry in a fight out in the local bar called the Oasis a couple weeks prior. So his initial thought was, could this be a continuation of that? And that motorcycle club was called the Lucky 13 Motorcycle Club. The lifestyle that he led, uh, people that he hung out with, you know, maybe it was some type of retaliation. Detectives ask Petey if someone else may have been angry with Mike. While he can't think of anyone, Petey admits Mike was very popular with the ladies. He was known through his hangouts as he was a ladies' man. You know, he didn't, you know, stick with one girl very long. Armed with multiple leads, authorities next turn to Mike's heartbroken family to learn more about his personal life. His mother and father said even though he did have a past, when his son was born, that was the turning point for him. And he was starting to turn his life around and better himself for not only him, but for his son as well. Mike's family says he had dated his son's mother, Nicole Spinelli, for years, but the two had recently split. And within a couple of weeks, Mike started seeing a woman named Rachel Kozloff. When we were split up, Michael told me one day, you know, that he did meet a girl. Rachel was her name. So at that point, we're trying to gather as much information as we can about Rachel. A native of Erie, 30-year-old Rachel Kozloff was known for her lively, independent spirit. Rachel is a good person. She has a great personality. She has a great sense of humor. Despite her charismatic personality, Rachel had never been lucky in love. 
Rachel had four children with four different fathers. Some of them she remained friendly with, but regardless, she had four men in her life that gave her children and nothing else and walked away. What her love life lacked, Rachel made up for in motherhood. My mom is a loving, caring mama bear. She just wants the best for us, and she tried her hardest. She's always been a shoulder to cry on, a ear to listen, a mouth to give advice. Uh, she's always been there for all of us. Though raising four children was a financial struggle, Rachel always found a way to make ends meet. She jumped around from job to job. She did a bunch of different things. She instilled in me just to be an independent person. You don't need a man or a woman to be there to help you do anything. By February of 2012, Rachel had all but given up on love until Mike Henry walked into her life. I feel like Rachel was definitely trying something new in her life when it came to Mike because her other boyfriends weren't the same. They were more, I guess, mild compared to Mike. Though Mike seemed a bit rough around the edges, Rachel could see a future with him. He had been seeing other women. She knew that she was not his only girlfriend. But I think she thought that maybe they would have a relationship, just the two of them, one day. Rachel loved kids, you know, and maybe the combination of Mike having a son and that, you know, she saw that family unit, you know, and that, that kind of endeared her to Mike. Mike's family says although he was in a relationship with Rachel, he and Nicole still loved each other. We were, like I said, so much confusion, and, do you, you know, do you want to let him go? Do you want to try to work it out? And, you know, so you were, I was still together with him. According to Mike's family, in mid-March, Nicole had to leave unexpectedly for a family emergency and has been there ever since. I was actually had to go to Ohio, and I was going to be in Ohio for like a month, and it was unexpected. So um, while I was down there, he had Jackson at the time. After finishing up with Mike's family, detectives tracked down Nicole. This is informational in nature, and we just want to gather as much information as we can. We want to talk to everybody who may have been involved. Police confirm Nicole was out of town at the time of Mike's murder, eliminating her as a suspect. Next, detectives work to track down Mike's new girlfriend. We needed to speak with her immediately. Just four hours into the investigation of the brutal homicide of Motorcycle Club member Mike Henry, detectives have uncovered a number of leads. There was a fight involving Michael Henry and another member of the Lucky 13 Motorcycle Club. And he had a complicated love life. Mike's been in and out of relationships. Though detectives have verified the mother of Mike's son, Nicole Spinelli, was in Ohio at the time of Mike's murder, they have yet to track down Mike's current girlfriend, 30-year-old Rachel Kozloff. Luckily, it doesn't take long to find her. We were given information that Rachel Kozloff had driven to the police department. She was downstairs and ready to be interviewed. Mike's club members had reached out to her and said, hey, the police want to speak with you. Come down to the station. Rachel did not indicate that she knew why she was there. And we did not tell her. Detectives start by asking Rachel about her relationship with Mike Henry. We've been together since Valentine's Day, and, like, everything is good. We've literally had three disagreements, not even fights, just verbal disagreements. I asked her just to go through her, her day, her evening. Rachel says around 6.30 p.m., she stopped by Mike's to have dinner. And that's when things got intimate. Rachel says that when she goes over there, he asks her to pleasure him. I asked, is this something that you normally do? And she said, yes, this happens all the time. She said, but when I go to pleasure him, he smells of sex. Don't ask. He always tells me he has a off, so apparently he did. Okay. Rachel says after Mike explained himself, the two were fine and she left shortly after. But around 9 p.m., while she was out with a friend, Mike initiated a fight over text. 
out of nowhere, I get a text that pretty much just off, and I'm like, that's literally what he sent me. I'm like, okay, where'd that come from? Were you really that pissed that I questioned you, or is it that I'm out? And that's when he said, sick of your Rachel explains that the texts were going nowhere, so she decided to return to Mike's apartment. She wanted to go there and see how he was doing and make up with him. According to Rachel, she arrived at Mike's around 9.30 p.m. and had to park in the adjacent lot since the parking lot outside of Mike's building was full. She says that she walks around the building, goes in, and lets herself in because she has a key, and walks into his apartment and says, what's up? What's going on? So we sat there for a little bit and talked, and pretty much everything seemed fine then. Rachel says Mike then went to the bathroom. And at that point, she sees a number on his phone that she doesn't recognize. So, according to Rachel, she memorizes that number. According to Rachel, when Mike came back, he went into a rage. He, like, started yelling, telling me to get out, and I was like, what's going on? We, you know, we were fine, you went to the bathroom now, you're freaking out on me. Rachel says he grabs her by the arm, he pulls her off the futon, and he throws her into the wall. I'm like, well, I need my stuff. And apparently me trying to get my stuff pissed him off more because then he opened the door to the back and threw me down the steps and then threw all my stuff with me. Rachel claims she has no idea what caused Mike's sudden outburst. So she thinks, I'm going to call that phone number because it's got to be something that's going on. Why he's acting like this. She says a woman answers on the other end of the phone. According to Rachel, the woman identified herself as Josie Noble, an ex-girlfriend of Mike's. She asked me who I was, and I told her. And I'm like, you know, what's going on? And she's, I don't know if she thought I was accusing her of something, because she first started, you know, well, nothing, we're just friends. Hours later, Rachel says she received an ambiguous text from one of Mike's friends. He asked me if I was with Mike, and I said, no, you know, I left him. And then I kind of didn't hear anything, so I texted him. I was like, so what's going on? He's like, nobody knows anything. Yeah, cops here need to talk to you. Please come. Detectives ask Rachel if she owns a gun. Um, I did. Yeah, I had a, uh, a Glock, but I haven't been able to find it. And, well, since we were at an Oasis a couple weeks ago. She tells us she lost her gun. She's not sure where it's at. The last time she saw it, it was in Michael Henry's center console in his truck. Though Rachel appears genuine, detectives can't help but think she's hiding something. At this point in the interview, I thought I would let her know why she was actually there at the police department. Well, Rachel, I am sorry to tell you that uh, Mike is deceased. There is Rachel Kosloff immediately sobbing and breaking down. And we both looked at each other and said, she either didn't do this or she's the best actress in the world. I know this is going to sound insensitive, but do you know what happened? <laughs> the only thing I know is that he was shot out of the Oasis. He was shot out of the Oasis? Yeah, in the parking lot. Him and this other motorcycle club had a beef. Rachel says last month, a physical fight broke out between the members of Mike's club and the Lucky 13 club. It was such chaos. We got to the door and that's when the other people started shooting at him. And that's when we all tried to get the hell out of there. <sighs> Before concluding Rachel's interview, detectives assess her injuries. On her right arm, I did not notice any visible injuries. When I examined her right ankle, I did, however, note that it was a little puffy and there was a scrape on the side of her ankle. Rachel willingly turns over her phone, car, and clothing for analysis. As Rachel's items are sent to the crime lab, 
Detectives call in one of Mike's fellow club members and ask if Mike's murder could have been the rival gang coming back to finish the job. They had a misunderstanding and then they were kind of seeing who, you know, who was the um, alpha club. He told police that the Lucky 13 and the Iron Wings were at peace. Investigators work quickly to confirm this claim. We learned there hadn't been any issues with Lucky 13 in the past several weeks after the Oasis incident. Once our criminal investigation detectives had time to talk with their club members, we ruled out that it could be a rival gang that did this crime. They were all extremely upset and concerned about Mike. And it did not appear to us that they were responsible for his shooting. It's been two days since the shooting death of Mike Henry. After eliminating a rival motorcycle club for Mike's murder, detectives decide to track down Josie Noble, the woman Mike's girlfriend Rachel Kozloff claims was in contact with Mike on the night of his death. She's a friend of Mike and a former ex of Mike's. She said that Mike had reached out to her and she hadn't heard from him in months. He subsequently sent a picture of his son to her. And she responded back, cordially, oh, he's cute, how are you? And that was the extent of that conversation. Josie says later that night, she got an alarming phone call. On the other end was a woman that said, who are you? And of course, Josie said she responded, well, who are you? As in, who is this woman yelling in the phone, asking me who I am? Josie's depiction of the encounter greatly differs from the one Rachel Kozloff described. It was the exact opposite of what Rachel said. She was threatening. She was rude. She attacked her. It was not civil at all. Following her interview, Josie was subsequently ruled out as a suspect. With Rachel's cell phone already in hand, detectives pour over her phone records and find a different type of relationship with Mike than the one she had portrayed. They didn't just fight, literally only three times. They fought nearly every day. The final text exchange between the couple suggests that on the night of April 12th, Mike was ending the relationship for good. He's basically told her, get lost, I'm done with you, I'm sick of your shit. So she sends out a text to Michael Henry, sleep tight, I'll talk to you tomorrow. She, in turn, goes and drives over to Michael Henry's apartment, unannounced. But that's not all the texts reveal. April 10th, just two days before the murder, we have a text conversation between her and Mike, asking her if he wanted her to bring her gun over to the apartment. So this dispels her initial story that she lost her gun. Evidence continues to pile up when detectives dig up surveillance videos from Mike's building and catch Rachel in a myriad of lies. The lot was not full. She instead parked one street over in an effort that her vehicle, uh, we theorized, her vehicle would not be spotted by Mike Henry because the parking lot was right beneath his window. She stated in her first interview that she exited and left after being thrown down the stairs the same way she came in. We could not find that on the video, which means she left another way. That only left one other door that she could have gone out without being caught on camera, and that was the door down uh, through the vacant apartment down to the street. On April 16th, detectives confront Rachel with the discrepancies they have found. Okay, so you pulled up so I was full. Why was the lot full? Because everybody was downstairs at later on. And what did you say happened to you get? Last time I saw it was the Oasis car fight, which I think was like March 25th or something. It was in his truck. You have no idea where that gun is? No. No, absolutely not. You know, Rachel, I've been doing this for a long time. Okay? Mm-hmm. And your story has enough inconsistency in it. A few things aren't making sense. Like what? I told you exactly how everything happened. I mean, if you just got thrown down the steps, would you go back up the floor? If I had a gun on my person, would? Yeah, no. Detectives ask Rachel once again how she got in and out of Mike's apartment. She stated she had gone right to the back door because she had a key, and that's the door she went into. 
I watched the video, Rachel. You walked up the front stairwell. No, I didn't. It's on video. Um, I didn't. Did you what? Stop? I don't care. I know what I did and didn't do. You need to start telling the truth. Well, I'm done. I told the truth. She denied no less than 17 times that she had shot and killed Michael Henry. She had lied about what she was wearing, what door she had gone in and out of. All the discrepancies continued to mount. And that, based on the evidence that we had, we decided that we were going to arrest her. Our theory of the case was that this was a very possessive woman, uh, possessive of her boyfriends. Rachel Kozloff was charged with criminal homicide murder, aggravated assault, recklessly endangering another person, and possessing instruments of a crime. Rachel's family is shocked to learn of her arrest. I was devastated. I was like, no. You know, she would never do that. She would never do that. I think I had a lot of emotions anger, worry, like what's going to happen to her, what's going to happen to the kids. In November of 2012, prosecutors in Erie County are working hard to secure their case against 31-year-old Rachel Kozloff for the murder of 31-year-old Mike Henry. There was not any direct evidence at that point in time that Rachel Kozloff had committed the murder. And time and time again, she denied and denied and denied. Then, three weeks before the trial is set to begin, they receive a game-changing piece of evidence from the crime lab. What we learned was her pants had GSR residue on them. Empowered by this new evidence, when Rachel's trial begins on December 3rd, prosecutors come out swinging, asserting that Rachel killed Mike Henry in cold blood. Rachel Kozlov would not accept the fact that the relationship was uh, in a downward spiral, and he essentially was kicking her to the curb. I think that she suspected he might be seeing somebody else. So the night that she went there, she saw that strange number and called it and got a woman on the other end. That just sent her to the next level. Prosecutors bolster their claim through text messages, video surveillance, and the gunshot residue found on Rachel's clothing. The evidence pointed right to Rachel. She was the person that had been lying throughout this entire process. Everything just all led back to Rachel every time. When it's the defense's turn, they finally admit that Rachel shot Mike Henry, but argue it wasn't premeditated. The defense says that it was self-defense, that Rachel was in fear for her life during the altercation in Mike's apartment that night. To support their claim, Rachel takes the stand and gives a shocking new version of events. She stated that she was pushed down the stairs violently by Mike. Rachel then testified that she gathered herself and her belongings at the bottom of the stairs when Mike came back down and dragged her up the stairs back to the apartment where the fatal fight ensued at that point. It was either she shoot him and stop him from attacking her or he was going to kill her. It wasn't that she wanted to do it, it's that she had to do it. Prosecutors counter by noting the evidence simply does not support Rachel's new version, even if she did have a slightly swollen ankle when she was interviewed by police. This is just my theory, that she stumbled and fell and was trying to get in and around and get out of there as quick as she could. Because there was no indication that Mike had thrown her or her purse down the stairwell. He wasn't a monster like she described. As far as, like, you know, beating up women, I don't think that was his style at all. On December 7th, 2012, the jury breaks for deliberations. The verdict did not take long uh, for the jury to completely dismiss Rachel Kozlov's story of self-defense. The jury's unanimous verdict was that she was guilty of third-degree murder. 
I pretty much gave her every opportunity to tell me, hey, it was obvious from your guys' text that you had problems. You know, please, let me help you. Tell me what happened. If it's a crime of passion, it's a crime of passion. But she denied, denied, denied. Her story just seemed to change. I think the fact that the baby was there when it happened was maybe the most disturbing part for the jurors. On January 29th, 2013, Rachel is sentenced to 18 to 40 years. I was in shock. I just still can't believe that she would go to that to that level, you know, and, and kill him. It changed everybody's lives. It was devastating for our family. You know, my wife and I, the kids, I mean, they lost their mom. She does feel very remorseful about, you know, what she did and how it impacted, you know, so many people. I believe in all my heart when she pulled that trigger, she was defending herself and her family. And uh, unfortunately, once she started to tell the truth, it just didn't matter. Though Rachel still maintains her actions were that of self-defense, many believe that she was just a woman that had been pushed too far. I believe that on the night of the homicide, it was just one rejection too many. I think Rachel snapped. We're really never going to know what happened the night of April 12th between Mike and Rachel. She had proven herself to be a liar, which is sad in her case because if he did really physically abuse her, we're never going to know if that's true or not. Though justice has been served in the eyes of the law, the events of April 12, 2012 have a lasting impact. Our family broke up after that. My parents got divorced. We all went our separate ways. My mom's now in Florida. My dad has all three of the boys. Uh, the daughter's with her dad and her stepmom. We're just, we're all split up. I think the biggest tragedy is Mike's no, you know, not here to, to grow up with his son. Because at the end of the day, that's what he really, really wanted. He would have been an amazing father, I know it. The two tragic incidents in this video highlight the fact that you are more likely to meet your demise by someone you know. By watching my videos on primetime crimes, we can learn to recognize the warning signs leading up to the incident in each video and take the necessary action to remove ourselves from dangerous people or potentially dangerous situations. Thank you for subscribing, liking, and sharing this video and for your continued support of my channel.